there, students. This is going to be our first lecture primarily on the board. While I think it's tempting to see mathematics as the sort of boring kind of hypothetical part of computer science, one of the things that I want to convey very early on in this course is how the formal interpretation or mathematical interpretation on the board is really just another kind of equivalent way of understanding how programs work. And that's something we're going to try to get at today. In this lecture, we're going to take our first step towards understanding the semantics of programs, and we're going to try to give you a useful mental model for how programs execute in the computer. This model that we're going to talk about today is called textual reduction semantics. Textual reduction is a way of specifying how programs execute by describing how to textually reduce a program via a series of steps. Now, this style of semantics has a rich history and is traditionally called term rewriting. However, you don't really need to know any of the formal background to understand this lecture, and we're really going to build up a semantics as we go by term rewriting pretty soon. In this lecture, we're going to give a sort of a semi-formal account of how term rewriting works, and we're also going to give a bunch of examples. We're going to continue working through some of those examples in class with exercises. Now, I'm going to focus today on a language that I'm going to call if a rith. Now, if a rith is just the subset of scheme that we've seen so far that includes numbers, booleans, and primitive arithmetic and boolean operations, along with if. Now, we'll see how we can use textual reduction on the board to specify precisely how to execute programs that use this subset of uh, rackets. And pretty soon, we'll also be building interpreters that actually implement, using the computer's machinery, the same thing as we'll see on the board today. So first, we're going to do it on the board and on paper, and then we're going to switch to being able to show how we can actually build interpreters that follow this kind of technique. Now, textual reduction is not the most efficient way to implement an interpreter, but it's a good way to start because it gives us nice ground truth that allows us to simply understand how the program executes. And in fact, when I think about how program executes, um, I really follow this model myself. All right, so let's dig into it. All right, so I'd like to start by explaining why we even want to use S expressions in the first place and motivate why this is kind of the default choice. So to start with, I'm going to write some expressions in normal infix notation. And I'm going to describe how we can sort of compute them down to a value in a systematic way. This is how we're going to start our computation. So for example, we might have 2 plus 7 times 3. We might also have 17 plus 15 minus 3 divided by 2. All right, so using the rules of mathematics, uh, PEMDAS is what I learned it as. So that was parentheses, um, exponentiation, multiplication, division, addition, and then subtraction. So using these sort of arithmetic binding rules that we learned in grade school, I could represent 2 plus 7 times 3 using this tree over here on the right, where I have sort of plus, and then to the left of it is 2, and then to the right is this sort of subnode 7 times 3. Now for 17 plus 15 minus 3 divided by 2, I could sort of maybe represent that two equivalent ways. Uh, the, the thing that I'm doing now is kind of not the normal interpretation if you're going to take the PEMDAS one. So I'm sort of doing addition first. But it ends up being OK because of sort of uh, the way that plus and minus play with each other, right? So I could also imagine another interpretation where I translate this to another kind of equivalent tree, where instead of having plus on the top, I actually have minus. And that would be this interpretation where I would say 17 plus 15 minus 3 divided by 2. All right, so using this kind of methodology, I'm going to get uh, minus at the top, and then I'm going to get the divide to the right. I'm going to have 3, 2, and then on the left side, I'm going to have my plus, and I'm going to have 17 and 15. All right, so Using this mechanism, if I write them out in trees this way, I can actually compute the result by just kind of summing up the tree using the corresponding operation. So if I do 7 times 3, I get 21. I then propagate that up the tree, and then I do 2 plus 23. I get the right answer. I can do the same thing on the left side. I don't really remember why I used uh, have so much. Probably shouldn't have done that, uh, but it kind of works out still all the same. And I can see on the left, I get 17 plus 15, which I'm struggling to do the math in my head here, but the answer is 
our friendly old 32. Minus 3 halves is going to give us the same result we got on the left, 30 and a half. All right. All right. So one of the important lessons here is that each of these trees uniquely maps over to a scheme command, one of these S expressions. We call these parenthesized expressions S expressions or structured expressions. And they map precisely to one of these tree-like expressions. And I want to sell you on the fact that this is a cleaner representation, a more explicit representation than the kind of thing we can write using infix style. Now, yeah, it's true that for some restricted cases, it might be a little bit more uh, advantageous or maybe a little bit crisper to write things in infix style. But if we want to come up with a basis for how to define what our programs mean, it's kind of nice if we have this simple uniform style. And to manipulate programs as text, it's going to be really helpful for us to have this S expression style. So for all of these different trees that I have on the board, I can cook up with corresponding S expressions. Now see over here how I have this minus on top, that means that I have the corresponding sort of minus that uh, comes first in this expression over here. So it's really important to be able to map back and forth between what the actual representation of the syntax looks like as a tree, for example. In compilers, this is called an abstract syntax tree. And what the representation looks like as an S expression. So if you ever get confused, think hierarchically about uh, what these things are actually doing. All right. So now let's start to do some computation with these things. So I'm going to use this little symbol right here. And this symbol means reduces to. So there's something on the left of the symbol, and there's something on the right of the symbol. Now I'm going to be able to reduce an expression to another expression when I can differentiate those by making a single step. And what I mean by that is by reducing a single application of a function at a time. Notice here how in the top one I went from plus 2 times 7, 3 to plus 2, 21. So that first step that I was able to do was multiplying 7 times 3. That corresponds to the fact that over here in the tree, and so you can sort of see how the different parts of the tree relate to the steps that I take. So now let's see what happens when I do reduce the next expression. Now, one interesting thing about this expression is that there are multiple different steps that I could take. If I want to only apply a single function at a time, which is my rule here, so I can only ever do one application or one you know, addition or one subtraction at a time, if I only want to do one, I can either choose to reduce plus or I can choose to reduce uh, multiply. And so here I'm doing, uh, I'm doing plus first, but I'll also see how I can do uh, multiply. So if I do plus first, I get 32 on the left, then I have to reduce um, division because remember, I always have to be able to reduce my arguments before I can actually apply the function. That also relates to the fact that Racket is what's called a call by value language. So like I said, I also could have reduced the right side first. So if I did that, then instead of taking the step where I reduced 17 to 15 first, I'd be taking the step where I reduced divide 3, 2 into 1 and a half. And remember that Racket represents fractional numbers in a really nice and robust way. All right, so this just goes through normally. I reduce the right side first, but... All right, now in general, what I'm doing is I'm taking the program and I'm applying a various set of rules called reduction rules to go from one step of the program to the next. In this case, I'm using an instance of what's called small step semantics where I take one small step at a time. And when you put each of these different intermediary results into a chain like this, where they all connect by stepping to each other, you call that sequence of steps that leads to some final result, you call that a reduction sequence. So a reduction sequence is a sequence of steps wherein I've transformed the program by applying some reduction between the first one to the second one to the third one. So anytime I have a sequence of things that
that all, where I can reduce from the first one to the next one, from the next one, so on. That's a reduction sequence. All right. All right, so just to say it again, a reduction sequence is just some sequence of programs where between each of those programs, I've taken a valid step. All right, so let's think precisely, when are we allowed to make a transition from one step to the next? So what we need is we need a set of rules that governs when I can step between various programs. So one of the rules that I'm going to say is I'm going to say, whenever I have an application of some primitive form, so whenever I have something like n0 plus n1, and this really should be written in S expression notation, so I'll switch to the S expression notation pretty soon. But whenever I have an application of some primitive form, then I can always perform a reduction of that primitive form down to the actual uh, implementation of that function. So that's going to be our first rule. It just says, if I have two constant values as arguments, and that's an important part, they have to be both constant values. They can't be, for example, other expressions. But once I have two numbers, n0 and n1, then I can actually perform that reduction and implement that operator. And in what happens in the rest of the sub, uh, rest of the lecture, I'm going to assume that I don't just do that with plus, but I also do that with any other built-in uh, operator. All right, and the next rule that I'm going to give is I'm going to say, if E0 reduces to E1, and if some other expression, E2, contains E0, then I'm going to be able to say that I can replace E0 with E1 in E2, and that will be a valid reduction as well. So we're gonna to have to think precisely about what that means, but this basically means if a sub-expression of a larger expression reduces, then I can apply that sub-expression and then plug that hole and be able to make some progress. Now, this is not the rule we're ultimately going to want, but let's just see a consequence. If we were to do this, and if we were to adopt this rule, how would it allow us to do this computation? So let's look at an example program where I have plus two times three, and then divided by four and two. All right, so I can apply the first rule. I can apply rule one, either two times two, three, or divided four, two, four, two. So here I'm gonna apply the first rule, and I'm going to say, okay, well, two times three can apply, that can give me six, and then I can textually reduce down to plus six, and then divided four, two. And then next, I can perform the other side of the operation. I can textually reduce four divided by two to down to two using the first rule. And then again, using the first rule, I can perform this addition up to eight. Now, I also want to say, back when we were doing this last exercise, we were actually using the second rule as well, because to replace two times three by six, I had to replace inside of this larger piece of syntax, right? I had to replace inside the S expression here. So, down this left branch is choosing to make progress on the left side of the expression. And then I make progress on the four divided by two and then compute that down to eight. Now, I similarly could have chosen to evaluate the right-hand side first, at which point I would be replacing four by two uh, down to two. So let's think about how we can extend our rules to make things a little bit more deterministic because it's generally not good when our semantics is non-deterministic. For example, I would hate it if Racket always flipped a coin to decide if it was going to evaluate the order of arguments from left to right instead of right to left, right? I could imagine the world in which Racket might just have some non-defined order in which it evaluated arguments. So most programming languages don't operate that way. If I actually want to use a language, I largely want its semantics to be predictable. 
And so one extension to the set of rules that I might impose is that I might say, when I'm evaluating a call's arguments, always make sure that I evaluate them from left to right. And so let's look at a consequence of how that might look if I were to try that on this example again. So let's try this other example where I do plus 3, 1, plus minus 2, 1. So if I use this rule right here, which is uh, what most modern languages do, I guess there are some languages in which arguments are evaluated right to left. In fact, I believe that was a feature of a racket at one point. Um, but now we choose to reduce this plus 3, 1 down to 4, and then now we're left with reducing the minus 2, 1 on the other side. We reduce that down to just 1. And then we perform this final reduction here. So notice here that the choice was whether to do the first or the second. Okay, let's look at a second example. All right, this next example is going to illustrate another problem with this set of rules that we've got going on so far. So now I'm going to have two separate expressions and I'm going to be faced with this dilemma. Even if I use this first rule here, I still have a little bit of ambiguity. So I don't know, should I reduce the left side of which of these expressions? Well, we're actually going to follow something now named applicative order. An applicative order says that when you're performing reductions in a language, always perform the leftmost, innermost reduction first. And when we start generalizing this, this is going to give us a notion in which we're performing the function and expanding that first, and then expanding all of its arguments, and then performing the application. And this corresponds to a well-known evaluation order when we stepped up to bigger languages called call by value. Now, there's another reduction strategy called normal order evaluation that we'll talk about a little bit later in the course, and that's one that actually is used in some other languages, including Haskell and uh, things like that. Uh, mostly lazy languages, so languages that don't reduce their arguments until they're necessary, which can be desirable in some circumstances, but we're going to focus on call by value languages in this course. All right, so let's see how this one actually executes. I'll speed this up because it's a pretty big ex expression. All right, so here I choose to go and evaluate that first plus. And did I do that correctly? It looks like I may have actually made a mistake. It looks like this inner plus should have actually been a two, but I'm gonna carry my work through. So. That's a mistake when I recorded the lecture. My mistake, I guess we'll hopefully do some better examples in class. I guess I wouldn't have done very well in the exam. But continuing with that through, I can sort of see here how I continue going, always evaluating the leftmost innermost expression. All right, so I'm always gonna work on that leftmost innermost side. All right, now let's think about how I could add if to my language. So I'm going to expand my form so that I can add if everywhere that I would be allowed to put an arithmetic expression. Now for today, I'm basically going to ignore type errors. I'm not going to say what happens, although I am going to assume that we're also going to have basic uh, Boolean types. So now instead of just having numbers, we're also going to allow ourselves to have booleans. And we're also going to allow ourselves to have guard expressions that use basic uh, boolean expressions. I'm not going to define precisely the semantics of and and or right now, although that is something we'll get into pretty soon. All right, so I'm just going to give two extra rules. The first rule is that I'm going to say I see if true et ef, I can always reduce that to et. So whenever I have true in my guard, I know that I can reduce that to whatever et is. But I don't want to ever do evaluation under a true or false unless I do this otherwise. So similarly, I'm going to say if false reduces to e sub f. So let's see how this actually gets used in a realistic looking program. So I might have something like if equal ha 
and then let's say something like uh, 0, 1. And I'm going to say if that's true, then plus 0 and 1. Otherwise, minus 2 and 3. All right, so how would I actually textually reduce this? Well, I can't actually perform the if until I have a value for the guard. So the first thing I have to do is I have to reduce that equal ha down to false. And I'm going to assume that we know how to perform equal ha just like we know how to perform plus and times and things like that. Now, once I have reduced that equal ha down to a false, I can actually then perform my normal arithmetic expression operation. And I'm choosing minus 2, 3 here. So that's what I get. So I reduce down to minus 2 and 3. Then I can just reduce that to negative 1. All right, so that's how we do basic textual reduction of programs. In future weeks, we'll talk about how to do this for more elaborate languages.